Welcome to the Why Factor, a chance to work out why we do what we do. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. Thanks for downloading the Why Factor, the BBC World Service program that seeks to explain why we do the things we do. In this week's episode, BBC Africa's Sami Awami asks, "Why do so many societies demonize women by branding them witches?" In his home country of Tanzania, it's led to the murder of hundreds of women. But what drives witch hunts? My sister's name was Sukuma Sali. She was 56 years old. She was a lovely person, very easygoing. She used to make cooking pots from clay. She loved to dance. My sister also liked farming. Welcome to the Why Factor on the BBC World Service. I am Sami Awami, and I'm in my home country of Tanzania with a shocking story of dangerous beliefs. Under a tree in a dusty village miles from anywhere, Nsamaka Masali cradles her grandson as she remembers what happened to her sister one day last August. On that day, I was grazing my animals far from here. So when I took the cows back home, it was around 7 in the evening. That's when I heard that my sister had been killed. They told me a group of people had got together. They beat her up, stoned her, and set her on fire. All because she'd been accused of being a witch. Sukuma's murder happened just four months ago. But it's almost identical to thousands of murders in other continents and other centuries. In this program, I'll be asking why women in so many different places and times have been denounced as witches. What makes them vulnerable to accusations of witchcraft? And why has the image of the witch as a powerful but sinister female had such a hold on the imagination at different times in different places? The explanations are not so much about superstition, but power, patriarchy and the place of women. Sukuma was one of five victims in her village. There was a group of men drinking at a pub in the village. They noticed a young girl who had come to pick up sand from outside one of the villagers homes. They arrested the girl and started questioning her, asking what she was doing. She said she'd been sent to fetch the sand by my sister. Slowly, the group of people got bigger and the girls started naming women in the village and saying they were witches. The next day, the men started rounding up those who were named, one after another, five of them. I wasn't there when they came for my sister. They found her alone. She was cooking. They grabbed her and took her far from the village close to the river, where they started asking her questions, then they beat her up, and then they burnt her alive. They thought she was a witch. Why did they think that? They were just being malicious. My sister is not a witch. They look at your life and see you're doing better than them. You have enough food and have more material stuff than them. Then they are likely to falsely accuse you of being a witch, but you're not. For those who've studied the history of witch trials, this story is far from unique. All of it sounds familiar. There's probably many more similarities than there are differences. The first really able generation of English witchcraft historians actually used African anthropology to try to understand the European witchcraft trials because they felt the issues were so similar. Diane Parkis is a professor at Oxford University and author of The Witch in History. The period where most of the witch trials in Europe occurred were the years 1450 to 1750, that 300 years. So how many cases happened during this period? The estimate that most historians agree on now is about 30,000 executions. 
90% of those accused of witchcraft in England and Wales were women. Why is that? Because in early modern history, witchcraft takes place within the sphere of domestic activities. What gets bewitched are women's works. It's women's housewifery, women's food preparation, women's child rearing. The kind of people who are likely to be in that domestic space with you are likely to be other women. Hence, the bog standard English witchcraft case involves one relatively poor woman accusing another relatively poor woman of being a witch. And yes, young girls are very common accusers in early modern England. Young girls like the one who accused Sukuma after a group of men interrogated her. Sukuma was a successful woman. She had land, cattle, and ran a cooperative making pottery. Her family believed she was targeted by neighbors who wanted to get their hands on what she had. And a similar mix of envy and insecurity fueled the English witch hunts, says Diane Parkis. What worried them most, what they were most afraid of, was hunger and issues around food provision. So what worried them about witches was that they felt like witches were going to take away their ability to provide food for their families or look after their children. They're kind of projecting onto witches their fear that they're not doing their jobs as housewives properly. It's much easier to believe that your butter has failed to turn all solid and lovely and golden because somebody's looked weirdly at it than it is to say to yourself, well, I made a giant mess of that. So I think in that way, a witch was a sort of convenient explanation for the things that are practically bound to go wrong in material life if you're not very well off. In Tanzania, the authorities are so worried by the latest killings, they've organized a village meeting. <laughs> District Commissioner Godfrey Ngopola is among those who've come to tell villagers the killers will be brought to justice and that there's no such thing as a witch. The government of Tanzania does not believe in witches, but the people believe in witches. Here in Undomo village, five women were killed because of the beliefs in witchcraft. Is this the first time these kind of killings have happened in this area? It's not the first time people to be killed because of their witches. It has been normal here in Tabola. And normally we can experience more than, let's say, six to seven killings in a month. Six to seven killings in, in a, a month. month. But killing five women at one time, this has been the first time. So why do people believe that these women are witches? When a thing is somebody's culture, it has been like a culture to most people here. Now it won't take a day to get rid of it. Maybe it will take some time. When I grew up, I believed that there is witches. So, but at this time, I just don't believe it. I just believe in God. So you, you once believed in witches and now yeah, you don't course. believe in that. And most of the people, especially in the Africans, they once believed in witches. It's because of these witch doctors. Now, witch doctors, if you go to them, then they will tell you a kind of story. They say, oh, you are a problem because of him. So people go to witch doctors when something has gone wrong in, with their lives. Yeah. And then the witch doctors tell them, that's because of your relative or your yes. neighbor who is a witch. Yes. And it is the witch doctors who will tell them that your problems are because of that and that and that. And then now is where problem begins. The person you're calling a witch doctor would probably have been what a European of the witch hunt period would have called a cunning man or woman. If your baby gets sick or your pig gets sick, you go and see the village cunning man and he will do a couple of sort of minor charms to work out why the baby is sick. Like they turned a sieve called the riddle with a pair of shears in it and they sort of spun it. And then when it pointed in the direction of a certain person's house, the cunning man would go, aha, it's this person who's made your baby sick. 
And so from that, you go along to the justice of the peace, the local magistrate figure, and you swear out a complaint against this other person. And then if the justice of the peace doesn't really believe in witchcraft, that'll be at the end of it. But if the justice of the peace does really believe in witchcraft, he will run around quite diligently interrogating people in the area about whoever you've named, and the whole thing will build and build, and you could easily end up with, you know, numerous people, like a dozen people all being tried together. So we are on our way to go and see a witch doctor. Uh, we don't know where his house is, so he has sent a young man here who was with us in the car to take us there. One of the biggest problems in this area is drought. The landscape here is very dry. We've seen a few small herds of cows, and you can tell they're struggling to find the grazing areas. OK, so he says we're almost there. He has spotted the witch doctor's houses. If you look at how God created women, they are not as physically strong as men, but spiritually they are stronger. In the world of spirits, if a woman makes requests from the spirits, she gets quick answers. But if a man makes requests, it takes longer. How many of the patients that you have received had problems because of a witch? Some people talk about witchcraft very lightly, but it is a big deal. Most people go their whole life without ever encountering a witch. Out of 10 people who come to see me, maybe two have a problem because of a witch. The issues we are having now are because witch doctors are using the idea of witchcraft to get money out of patients, blaming other people for their patients' problem, and thus causing conflict within communities. So when was the last time you denounced someone as a witch? In 2004. It was the year before my dad died. There was a young boy about 14 years old who came here as a patient. I was trying to heal him, but he wasn't getting better. So I had to go to my dad, who was also a witch doctor. I said, how come I can't help this boy? My dad told me, that boy is a witch. Take this herb and cast a spell on him and you will see what happens. So I came back and used the herb to cast a spell on the boy and suddenly next to him appeared an old woman. So that's when I realized I had not even been treating the real person. There was another person inside him, the old woman. She appeared as soon as I cast my spell on the boy. After that, I kicked them both out because they were not real patients. They were just messing with me. Wow. So according to traditional beliefs, how are societies supposed to deal with witches? You can just ignore them. Or you can cast a protective spell around your house. I'm very confident in my charms and spells. As I leave, the witch doctor's patients sing a song that's used as part of that protective spell. He may believe that witches are rare, but back in the village where Sukuma and her friends were killed, her neighbours are scared that they could be the next to be denounced. It's possible that I too could be accused of being a witch, because in our patriarchal system it's very common. Just because a woman has red eyes, then she is accused of being a witch. But that's because of the kind of fuel we used to cook with. The soot makes your eyes red. But then they accuse you of being a witch because of that. And when your face gets wrinkled because of becoming old, people start assuming that you must be a witch. So you also think one day it could also happen to you? It's possible because of how we live here in Africa. That's possible. In Tanzania, 400 women were murdered in witch hunts this year alone. But no one really knows why. 
many of the victims were divorced or widowed, with neighbors or family jealous of their independence, their land, or their cattle. Most lived in farming areas hit by drought, the kind of extreme weather conditions that some historians think helped spark the European witch hunts. One very intriguing suggestion is that it's connected with the Little Ice Age, which was the last great climate crisis to affect humanity. The Little Ice Age basically set in in the 1300s with tremendously bad storms and was immediately followed by the Black Death. So the population of England, because of those two things, dropped by 50% within 20 years. At that point, obviously, all sorts of things that had seemed reliable, like methods of agriculture or methods of housework, suddenly didn't work so well. So it might be that the stressor of the Little Ice Age pushed people into thinking that something supernatural was at stake. Professor Diane Parkes. Another possibility, which I think has more potential, is that there's a sudden drive in monasteries to worry about and ponder monks having nocturnal emissions or wet dreams. And the big question for the clergy is, are those monks sinning? Is there some way in which having nocturnal emissions is something they're consenting to, or is it involuntary? And the theology of that sort of develops, and eventually what they come up with is the idea that demons must be patrolling the dormitories at night, sitting on the monks, and making them have nocturnal emissions. So then further pondering, well, why would the demons want monastic semen? Well, they must be hoping to impregnate someone and have demonic children. And so that leads them then to imagine this group of women who are being impregnated by the demons who've collected the monastic seed. Hope you're following this. Um, <laughs> and, and then that's pretty much where you have the idea of witchcraft. What was it that wiped out belief in witches in, in Europe? Well, it hasn't really gone away. Um, it hasn't? No, uh, not in all parts of Europe. In Eastern Europe, there's still quite powerful witch beliefs, and it's still perfectly possible for the villagers to decide that you are a witch. If you hang around an ordinary village in, say, the Norman Bocage, you will find people who believe in witchcraft still. Robin Briggs has a case of a witch in northern France in the 1970s being shot to death with a 12-bore shotgun. So those beliefs don't just go away from the populace just because the elite stops believing in them. And the word witch has been reclaimed by followers of a modern religious movement that's inspired by ancient spirituality. In some parts of the world, there are women who are proud to call themselves witches. They even have shops dedicated to witchcraft. If you have a look up here, you will see that we do sell quite a few pentagrams and pentacles. Mm -hmm. This is the sign of um, a, a witch in this country. It's a very old symbol. It goes back to many countries, many different places. It's a five-pointed star with a circle around it, generally used as a symbol of witchcraft in this country today. Lise Williams is the owner of the Cat and Cordon shop in Glastonbury a town in the southwest of England. Dressed in jeans and a jumper, if you met her, you would never guess that she's a witch. But she belongs to a pagan coven and has shelves filled with books on how to cast spells and conjure spirits. There's a book here with the title The Witch's Goddess. Yes. The Feminine Principle mm. of Divinity. Yes. Is there a connection between witchcraft and feminism. Yeah, very much. A lot of women like witchcraft because they find it empowering. We have high priestesses as well as high priests in the tradition of Wicca. The Christian church tends to be very repressive towards women. You can't be as powerful. A Wicca and witchcraft tend to say, no, you can be more powerful than the guys. It's goddess-based, a lot of it. So I don't feel that I'm subservient to a man or to a god. If I need help, I can go to a goddess. Mostly witchcraft is, is for healing, for yeah. ritual magic. Um, sometimes people do it for things like prosperity, sometimes for fertility. Yeah. Um, I'm very cautious about that because, obviously, we do have a scientific tradition in this country. You don't want to encourage women that they can get pregnant if it's really not possible. Yeah. But quite a lot of them There's do find this There's another one here, very interesting. It's called mm. curse-breaker curse incense. Curse-breaking, yes. So if you think you've been cursed, most witches in this country won't curse. The most common form of witchcraft, which is wicca, 
developed in the 1950s out of older roots, people don't curse because there is a rule that if you do, it comes back on you three times. If you believe someone has been cursed, what are the telltale signs? I have to say that out of probably about 200 people who think they've been cursed over the last 10 years, I think only two of them are genuine. Most people, it's psychological problems. But if they have been cursed, then it's usually the sort of person who is not very superstitious, who doesn't really believe in this sort of thing, who has suddenly started having really bad dreams, really odd feelings, who's starting to become ill and who can't explain it. And the last person we had like this was a very nice woman from Nottingham up in the north of the country. She'd come to Glastonbury in desperation. She doesn't believe in any of this stuff. She doesn't know anything about witchcraft. But she felt that she had been cursed in some sense. It was just like a nagging feeling. And a colleague of mine rang up a practitioner in Nottingham. And she had been cursed. The person who had cursed her was the girlfriend of her ex-boyfriend. And this girl thought she should die as a death spell. So what did you use to actually tell that she was uh, indeed cursed? Uh, Well, we actually rang the bloke up and said, have you cursed her? There's only a few people who will do that. We have a network and telephones. We know who's likely to do it. And did this guy admit that he actually did the, the, the spell? Yes, he did. But he said also that he was going to take it off because this woman, who was crazy, basically, uh, wouldn't pay him. Wow. So he wasn't very pleased. So he said, Don't tell her not to worry, I'm going to take the spell off. I haven't been paid. And what kind of spells uh, have you cast? Uh, well, we've cast a couple of love spells, not without reservations, but we have cast them for people and they have worked. Um, but we also get asked a lot about getting my boyfriend back and then I try and talk them out of that because it's not a good idea. Uh, one of the laws of magic, if we can say they have laws, is unintended consequences. So you might get your boyfriend back, but he might be a psychopath. You don't want him. So it's really talking to people and saying, what do you actually want? What are your intentions? What do you need? The kind of witchcraft Lee's practices doesn't seem to bother her neighbours. She's even friends with her local church vicar. They go to the pub together and invite each other around for dinner. But all over the world, the fear of darker forms of witchcraft lives on, in films, books and popular culture, but also in the way societies react to powerful women. Here's Hillary Clinton dodging from a shoe. Can we just mention the fact that there were people on the Christian right who believed that Hillary Clinton was a witch during the recent American election campaign? That's the witch manifesting who she really is. Can we just mention the people who actually thought that she was demonically possessed and controlled by a demon? Here's Professor Diana Pakis on the many internet memes claiming Hillary Clinton is a witch. The reason they think that about Hillary Clinton is that they see her as transgressive. Those beliefs were strongly connected with her stance on abortion, with the fact that she's a career woman, so she's already sort of worryingly transgressive and ambitious. And it just is a straightforward case of somebody who's not being womanly in the right way, being felt somehow negatively to affect your womanhood and your motherhood and your femininity and getting denounced for it. So across these different times and places we are talking about, what's the common factor that makes a woman vulnerable to being called a witch? The perception that a woman has power over you and your household of any kind. So it doesn't matter where that power comes from being president or prime minister or whether it comes from being the the nanny who looks after your baby and who your baby therefore turns to rather than you. It's still power. And any powerful woman is open to being interpreted as a witch. I'm Sami Awami, and you've been listening to The Why Factor on the BBC World Service. You can check out previous editions on our website. Why not try the one about men, women and language? I hope you enjoy that edition of The Why Factor. You can download more BBC World Service programmes for free. Why not try More or Less, the programme that explains the numbers behind the